Hi, all you Far Away First fans. My name is Lisa Bruno, and I'm an objects conservator here at the Brooklyn Museum. And I am looking forward to doing a Q&A with you on Facebook. Um, so first of all, does everyone know what a conservator does or the difference between a conservator and a curator? It's a role in a museum. OK, well, what a conservator does is they're responsible for the care and preservation of the works of art in the collection. And um, the kind of training that you do to become a conservator is, it's pretty much standardized now in the United States where you study art history, studio art, and chemistry on an undergrad level. And then in graduate school, there's actually four programs now in um, art conservation in the United States. And that's where you specialize into either paintings, paper, textiles, furniture, or objects. And at the Brooklyn Museum here, we have paintings conservators, paper conservators, and an objects conservator like me. And by objects, it means uh, I deal with anything that's three-dimensional. So as you're all members of the museum, you know that involves everything from ancient Egyptian objects that we'll be talking about tonight to contemporary plastic sculptures that were made you know, two days ago. So it's a lot of variety, and that's what I particularly love about the job. And um, so should we get the lights? Sure. We're going to do a little PowerPoint first, and then we're going to pull out examples of some animal mummies so you guys can actually look at it. OK, now, the initial inception of this project to actually study our animal mummy research um, grew out of a project called To Live Forever, which is a, actually a traveling exhibition, um, which our curator, Ed Bleiberg, he has a particular knack of uh, going into storage and looking at objects that haven't ever been on display at the Brooklyn Museum or haven't been on display in a long time and trying to think about new ways to present them to the public. So this exhibition uh, discusses funerary practices from the Old Kingdom to Roman period, but he's particularly focusing on how economics played a factor in that. So if you were royal, what would your coffin look like? But if you were, say, less of means, kind of like us, what would your burial tomb look like? What would your coffin look like? What could you afford? And that's the theme of this show. And I'm really happy to say that it's actually coming to the Brooklyn Museum in um, February of 2010. So hopefully we can do some programming around that, because there were some great objects that really have never been on display here and there were some really interesting treatments and part of this exhibition includes um, two dog mummies and a human mummy we actually studied the human mummy for the exhibition um, this is Demetrius he was excavated in Hawara Egypt in 1910 by the uh, British School of Archaeology and so then in 1911 he came direct basically from the excavation to the Brooklyn Museum so this is um, Unlike some objects that don't have an archaeological provenance, um, he actually has a, an actual provenance. And part of the study, he is part of a group of Roman mummies that are called red shroud mummies, and that's because they're covered, their final layer of linen is covered with um, this red painted shroud. So there's probably about 14 known in the world, and they're in all different collections. Um, there are two actually at the Getty Museum, and a scientist at the Getty Conservation Institute wanted to study these mummies. So th he, they came out to Brooklyn, they took samples of the paint. Um, the really interesting thing is he found that the paint was made from red lead, and because it was made from lead, you could do lead isotope analysis on it which they did with our paint samples, as well as I think six others that they tested. And they isolated the source of the lead to be from a region in southern Spain called Rio Tinto, which today is a mining region as well, which says something about trade routes in Roman Egypt, that they were actually getting the source of this paint, the lead for the paint, from southern Spain. But the really interesting thing is that all the trace elements were exactly the same for all of these samples of paint, which would lead him, led him to believe that it came from basically the same can of paint. So all of these mummies were found at all different times in all different parts of Egypt, but clearly they were processed and became mummies at the exact same time in the exact same place, which is pretty fascinating. So that was one interesting thing. The second thing was there was always a question about his age, um, because he, when he was cataloged, his Fayum portrait, which is this here, which is made from a really thin piece of wood, 
had already been removed from the mummy because uh, I think it was removed in the 30s here at the museum and we have a record of that because people were thinking we'll never put the mummy on display. So they took the beautiful portrait off and that was on display for several years in the galleries and um, then the body was actually properly cataloged because of the spelling of the name Demetrius and because it was dirty at that point uh, people actually cataloged him as being female because they thought it was a female spelling of the name. And they also cataloged the name, uh, the age, as being 89, which our curator thought that doesn't make any sense. I mean, 89 is pretty old for an ancient Egyptian to live, so how old is he really? First of all, is it a he, and how old is he really? And um, so we took the body to the North Shore Hospital and we did CT scanning which is actually a form of x-ray, but it's a little fancier in that in an x-ray you look at the entire, you look through one plane of the object but the entire object, whereas in CT scanning you can actually isolate planes. So here we have a cross section. And this is just a little uh, refresher on how to look at an x-ray. Um, anything that appears white means it's denser and more radio-opaque. So this area right here, this is actually his body, and so the dark spots here are the tissues of his body. Whereas these are his arms, here and here. This is his vertebrae. Um, this is his rib cage. And these, the doctors at North Shore said these were gallstones, which could have had something to do with his death. Um, they looked at the body and said it was probably the age of a 50-something year old man. So that was interesting. And then when we ended up cleaning uh, the paint surface here, uh, the inscription of his age, I think, is here, and it became much clearer that the symbol that was interpreted as an eight in the 30s when he was cataloged was actually a five. So, so that inscription plus the scientific data plus the fact that of all these mummies that have been CT scanned, their portraits do seem to be in conjunction with the same age as them. So that all seemed to jive in terms of him being... Um, that age. The other thing that we had to, that we did is we did carbon-14 dating on the linens and he died somewhere between 300 BCE and 98 ACE, which makes sense that stylistically the portrait would have been first century and the carbon-14 dating also corresponds with that. So that study um, is what really got our curator thinking that let, why don't we take a look at all of the mummies in our collection. So Brooklyn has about seven humans and over 60 animals and there's a huge variety of styles uh, and some of them actually include coffins. Like here's an example of an ibis coffin that's on display in the third floor galleries and it's a particularly special coffin because first of all it's um, made from wood that's been gilt and it has these beautiful um, mounts of the head and the feet made out of silver. And it's actually a very unique object in the history of Egyptian art. So when we took an x-ray of this, um, what we find inside is actually you know, a mummified bird, um, which indicates to us that it is ancient. The other thing, and again, looking at the x-ray, you know that dense objects are radio-opaque. So the, it makes sense that the silver objects here are totally, they're solid cast. But the other thing that we notice is it's not fitting so tightly in here. There's this other radio opaque material that's fitting around this. And you think, okay, this is a really special object. It was made really well. You think the mounts would fit better into the wood. I mean, maybe not, but it sort of makes us think, well, let's look at this a little closer. So we actually did a metal analysis on the silver and Unfortunately, we found zinc in it, which in all the studies that have been done on ancient Egyptian silver, zinc is really not a component of ancient Egyptian silver. So what does that say? <laughs> um, there are examples of wooden ibis coffins that have copper alloy mounts of heads and feet. Um, and this just is... Uh, this is just an example of the problem that can sometimes happen with objects that are collected that don't have an archaeological provenance. Because we got that ibis coffin in 1949 directly from a dealer in Cairo. 
So we don't have a history. We don't know when those silver mounts were added. Now, they could have been added in the 19th century, sort of as a, a means of venerating the object um, immediately after it was excavated. Or it could have been added in 1949 as a way of like making this object more expensive and more special because you know they wanted to sell it to a museum like the Brooklyn Museum. Now, I, as an objects conservator, my job is not to interpret that. My job is just to present the information to the curator. And it's, I'm so glad that it's his job to actually <laughs> interpret that. But um, this uh, copper alloy ibis head is actually also on display right now in the Egyptian galleries. So another form of animal mummy coffin that's particularly special that we have are um, metal ones. This is a figure of Wajit Bas, which is a protector goddess. And um, when we actually got brought this to the lab, we just thought it was a statue. Uh, at the time, we didn't have an x-ray that was powerful enough to actually go, go through the object, so we couldn't x-ray it. Um, we knew that it had, had been broken and repaired at the base. And underneath, like right here, there was this plaster plug that was part of a restoration. And the problem with the plaster is that it was retaining moisture. And what happens a lot with archaeological objects is they've been exposed to salt water. So there's chlorides within the porous body of the object. And chlorides and copper react with moisture to form this um, corrosion product that's called bronze disease, which is particularly invasive and that can actually destroy the object. So we knew we had to get the plaster plug out. There was a lot of bronze disease, and we had to basically treat the object. So we started excavating. And what we found inside were all of these bones, which at the time when we th were thinking this was just a statue, we're like, uh-oh, what's happening here? <laughs> so we um, contacted some animal mummy specialists and some other Egyptologists who basically said that they thought that the bones were from this animal, which is an Egyptian mongoose called an ichneumon. Um, and ichneumons were protective in a way because mongooses kill snakes. So it actually makes a lot of sense that a mummy of an animal who was killing snakes would be found within the symbol of um, protector goddess of uh, Wajit Bast. So I think this gets to the um, heart of why the Egyptians made animal mummies. Because I think in the past, a lot of people thought, oh, animal mummies are really just you know, someone's pet. They were uh, mummified and put into a tomb because you wanted your pet in the afterlife. Or they mummified animals that could have been useful in the afterlife, like something that you would eat. And then we actually do have examples of food mummies. There's a corn mummy that's on display on the um, third floor. But um, it doesn't actually explain, there's a lot, there's hundreds upon hundreds of animal mummies that are found in Egypt, and they're not all in tombs, they're in actual cemeteries. And so I think a lot of the um, ways that Egyptian uh, used animal mummies or their purposes were for more votive and sacred purposes. So in the Ptolemaic period, which is 305 to 30 BCE, um, there were actually royal decrees that said you must have these public processions and festivals to rejuvenate me, the king of Egypt. <laughs> and so you were sort of culturally forced to participate. And one of the methods to participate in these processions, and there are Roman writers who write of this, is making offerings of animal mummies. So if you think about it, we find mummies that are like that beautiful gilt ibis coffin. And we also have coffins like this in the collection, which is much simpler. This is um, just a simple wooden coffin with a crocodile on top, which probably would have venerated the god Sobek. Um, and when we brought this up to the lab to look at it, unfortunately it was disturbed like the um, Wajit mummy, so we weren't really sure what was inside. But we have another example of a mummy um, in the form of a cat, which would have been uh, venerating the god Bastet that wasn't actually disturbed. So this is something that maybe a more common person could have afforded to use in some of these public processions. Now, when we brought it to the lab, the curator thought, oh, there's not going to be anything inside. But when we x-rayed it, what we found was this jumble of little bones, which um, you know, it says that the first fact that not all animal mummies 
consists of a whole animal. And it's quite possible that it was really a question of economics as to why this happened. Um, so since there seems to be many uses for animal mummies, um, there probably was many different ways to make them. But this is sort of the traditional way that people thought that animal mummies, and some animal mummies are made this way. And it follows the way the human mummies are made exactly. So basically, you make an incision. You do take out the internal organs. Um, there is a salt in Egypt called natron, which is sodium carbonate, which is totally common, which kind of will dry out the organic tissue, sort of like sort of like beef jerky or, um, or um, rawhide. And then if that would then get wet, it would start to decay. So the next step was actually to seal the tissue or the organic matter all in, in with resins and tree sap and waxes. And in the past, people thought it was all done with bitumen, which is coal tar. And um, I'll talk about this a little bit later on. Uh, they're finding that it's actually a lot more varied than that. And then the whole thing was wrapped in linen bandages. <coughs> So here's an example of an animal mummy that's made in this traditional way. This is a cat, which is actually on display uh, now on the third floor. And uh, it's actually very well preserved, very well made, it's very tightly wrapped. Here's a detail of the face, which it, when you go down to look at it, you have to get in a kid's eye view for this because it's sort of in a big case low on the ground. So you, you really have to get down to see it. But the details of the face, and it's all painted on. So he's, he's particularly beautiful. And you can see some staining there, which is due to resin that was to preserve the body. Now, I know. It's, it's, he's a pretty amazing one, actually. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll look at some other ones later. But... So when we took the x-ray, we, because he was such a specially made mummy, we were kind of like not surprised to find uh, a whole cat inside. But what we found that was sort of interesting is um, there's signs of trauma, first of all. Like here's your vertebrae, right? And there's a little space here where it's not white. So that means that there's a little void there. And then you've got another vertebrae, another vertebrae, another one. And then, oh my god, you've got this huge area here that's light gray. So there's a dislocation. So it's as if his neck was snapped to kill him. The other thing that was interesting is, is this a pretty big tooth for a cat? <laughs> so we were kind of like, hmm, what's going on there? Um, and we're actually working with a vet from the NYU Animal Medical Center to help with animal identification. And of all the studies that have been done of animal mummies of cats, and the British Museum has looked at theirs, and the Leiden Museum has looked at theirs, there do seem to be these two groups. There's this wild jungle or desert cat, which seems to be one particular type of animal mummy. Um, and then there is also a second type of cat. And this is the, uh, another version of a, a cat mummy which is less well-preserved, it's certainly less elaborately made, although this one's also on display in the third floor, and he has a fantastic um, stone coffin that he's associated with. So presumably he was also relatively special, just not in as high state of preservation as the other one. So when we x-rayed this one, we also found signs of trauma, which you can see here is his little skull was crushed. So these are all breaks here. And he doesn't have those big fangs. And the shape of the head is a little different. So this is the second type of cat, um, which is the more domestic cat. And um, the interesting thing about this is that uh, now at UC Davis in California, there is a vet who's doing a study to try to see if there's a DNA link between domestic cat populations of today and animal mummy cat populations of ancient Egypt. So in doing our survey of all of our, our animal mummies, if we have material that we can contribute to the study, we're certainly going to do that. Um, the problem is, is you have to have either a tooth or a femur. And, uh, if you have a perfectly preserved, well-wrapped mummy, we're not going to open it up to get that material. But we also have less preserved samples in the collection. And if, in working with the vet, if we identify the right kind of material, we're, we'll certainly participate. Um, so let me show you one last cat. Sure. Why would they have killed it? 
Um, <laughs> well, why would they have wanted to mummify, mummify it? Be it's quite possible that it was either used during one of these public processions or it could have been used by priests at temples that were specifically set up for veneration of Bastet. And that just at certain times of the year, there would be a festival and they would make these offerings to the god, as opposed to these mummies actually be, being buried in someone's tomb. And, and actually, the second the purpose, the votive and the sacred purposes, I think is what most animal mummies were made for, as opposed to being in someone's private tomb. So here's another example of a uh, mummy that certainly looks like a cat, but um, when we x-rayed him, <laughs> you don't really find a lot inside. I mean, there may be, this might be a little bit of a bone, this other radio opaque material, probably stones. And this is what um, people like to call fake mummies. Um, and in the past, people would think of these mummies as being, oh, the priest was pulling a fast one on, you know, whoever was purchasing this and giving them something that they didn't think they were getting. But the fact that they're so common and they're in every collection and they're every type of animal mummy, um, you could look at it in another way and you could think, well, maybe it really is a question of economics. And, maybe someone could only afford so much money to buy an animal mummy to make as an offering. And maybe what they could afford was this, and it doesn't really have actual bones in it. It just has maybe rocks that were associated with you know, the mummification process or something. And again, that's interpretation, which I'm very happy that I don't have to do. But um, we're going to move on from cats now. The second, uh, another animal that was mummified a lot is the ibis. Um, and I actually brought this example out to show you. So this is one common form of ibis mummification where you have the head of the bird here sort of turned back on its back and then it's, the linen is folded in such a way to imitate wings and it's, it's actually a really beautiful type of mummification. And so when we x-rayed him, it, uh, you see that it's a whole bird inside. So that was you know, particularly lovely. Then there's another form that was used for birds, uh, ibises and hawks in particular, and this is called a humanoid form. And you can see it sort of looks like Demetrius in the sense that instead of having a Fayum portrait here, there was a, it's a wooden head, a uh, sculptural head in the form of an ibis, and it has an elongated body like a human and a little foot part here. And this is particular, this is also currently on display in the third floor Egyptian galleries. And it has this incredibly intricate pattern um, of uh, weaving here. So when we x-rayed this, again, we were expecting to find a whole bird. And what we find is this. And you're like, what is going on with this? In working with the vet, he said, this is definitely from an ibis, this bone here. But this bone here might possibly be from a cat. And that was really intriguing to our curator because he's like, well, did they intentionally mix the ibis bone, which would have been um, venerating Thoth, with a cat bone that would have been venerating Bastet? Again, it's, it's interpretation. It's not part of my job. Or, on the other hand, it could just be, well, the person wanted to spend the money on the elaborate wrapping. They couldn't really afford to have a lot of sacred material inside, so there's just some remnants that they put inside. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's interesting, but it's incredibly common in, um, in these animal mummies. So another type of animal that was mummified uh, was uh, crocodiles, and that would have been venerating the god Sobek. The thing with crocodiles is you'll find them, they're mostly small because if you think about it, as a crocodile gets bigger and bigger, it gets more and more powerful and more and more dangerous. So difficult to keep and difficult to kill. And that's actually one of the questions is how were these animals killed? This is also on display in the third floor. Uh, it's a very simple wrapping. It's basically the dried crocodile under there, one layer of linen, and then this linen tape wrapped around it. Uh, and when we x-rayed it, we don't really see signs of trauma like we did with the cats. You do see a crack here, but because the vertebrae are all lined up, this is something that happened post-mortem. So it could have happened during mummification. 
It could have happened during excavation. It could have happened during handling here at the Brooklyn Museum because really it's, it doesn't have a lot of packaging around this mummy. So when you, you touch him, you really feel the crocodile underneath and it's a dry and desiccated animal. So you move it you know, one way, the wrong way, you can get this kind of cracking. So our animal mummy expert, when she looked at this x-ray with our vet, uh, was like, well, there's apparently a theory that if you slit the nostrils of crocodiles, they would suffocate. And when she said this to us, I thought, well, that makes no sense, because you'd have to get really close to the crocodile to actually slit its nostrils, and how can you possibly do that? Um, and our vet was kind of like, no, that doesn't make any sense either, because they could still breathe even if their nostrils were slit. So it's quite possible that crocodiles may have been poisoned, as opposed to cats, which do seem to have undergone blunt force trauma to kill them. But um, the theory is maybe they were poisoned, uh, which an x-ray is not going to be able to tell you one way or the other. Um, so another uh, important animal that was mummified were bulls. And there is a, a bull deity called the Apis bull that was found in Memphis. And it's actually one of the first am animals to be mummified in um, 1300 BC. And I am so sad to say that the Brooklyn Museum used to have a bull in its collection, um, but it was deaccessioned in 1950. <laughs> but it was deaccessioned to the Smithsonian um, Museum of Natural History. So we know where it is and it's in safe care. Yeah? Sorry, how do you yeah. know that it was the first animal to be mummified? Because archaeologically they found, um, that's, it's been one of the oldest sites they found. They've actually found the site where they mummified the Apis bulls and there's these huge stone tables where they would, you know, eviscerate them and so, and it's because of the pottery and, and the other items they find in those areas, that's how they generally do the dating. So, um, that's, that's one way. So we have, we don't have our bull mummy anymore, but we have this little model of a mummy. And again, this is one of these things where, I think it's like six inches by eight inches. And so the curator's like, I don't think there's anything inside. But, and we're having a technical problem again. Yeah. yeah. I think it's maybe if we pause, I don't know. So how big is that? That one, it's probably like eight inches by six inches. So it's small and it does have a wooden component. Whoa. What? The ruler that you see in all the pictures? Oh, the ruler in all the pictures I think is six inches, generally, yeah. Um, yeah, some of them are really small. But, so this on the interior has a pretty giant bone, and we are working with our vet now to confirm that it's actually bovine. But it kind of gets to the point that maybe a lot of these mummies were votive. It's sort of not really unlike in medieval times when little bone fragments from a saint were put in shrines and then put in churches all around Europe. I mean, maybe this is a similar concept where you don't really need the whole animal, you just need a part of the animal or something the animal touched. If the animal is sacred enough, it could be made into a mummy in this sort of manner and would still be powerful and, um, and, and useful for the purposes of the day. So now we can do a little guessing game. So here you go. You see your ruler? It's six inches long. So you've got this little object. Now, I, I did a similar presentation to a group of um, sixth graders in Queens at a public school <laughs> who were studying animal mummies. And you know, I had said to them, you can have food mummies, you can have this. So they all thought this was a yam. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty creative on their parts, actually. So come on, let's give some guesses. What do you think this is? A rat. A fish, that's a good guess. A rat, that's a good guess. Corn. Corn, that's a very good guess. Any more, any more? Ready? It's actually a snake, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a really sweet little object. All right, um, the other part of this study that I sort of alluded to at the beginning is the resin analysis. The University of Bristol in England was actually one of the first institutions to start looking at resins that were used in mummification and looking at specifically animal mummies to see if it's the same type of resin that's used in human mummification. 
Because in the past, people will just think, eh, they're animal mummies. It's like less important than humans. They didn't use the same materials. And actually, what they're finding is the same materials are used. Um, the other thing that people used to think in the past, before a lot of analysis was done, well, if it's this brown resin, like this stuff here is all like this resinous material. It's brown. They called it bitumen, which is this coal tar. And actually, what people are finding is that bitumen is really not what this is most of the time. It really comes from different tree resins, which again can sort of um, give us information about tree, trade routes. Because you know there are certain cypress trees that may have been in Lebanon that weren't in Egypt, but if we're finding cypress tree you know resin on animal mummies that were made in Egypt, then it definitely says something about trade routes. So we're really happy to be participating in the study with them. And lastly, um, I don't exactly know when this is going to air, but the Animal Planet Cable Network um, came to Brooklyn because this is Salima Ikram, and she is our animal mummy expert. She's actually one of the uh, foremost. She's in, Egypt, though, She's in Egypt, yeah. She teaches at. Oh, you did? You're <laughs> kidding me. Well, she's famous. <laughs> yeah. That's very funny. No, I met somebody last night who knows her, too. But um, she teaches at American University in Cairo, and she's made the study of animal mummies sort of one of her specialties. She's actually mummified animals now to sort of walk through the process to see how it actually works. And um, she took the producers of this program around to different sites, archaeological sites in Egypt, the collection at the Cairo Museum, and she insisted that they bring them to Brooklyn because we actually have some really, some of the nicest animal mummies around. And um, so we spent a day filming, and they're also going to the University of Bristol to interview uh, the people who are doing the resin analysis. So I think it's coming out in March, but I'm not 100% sure, and uh, so I would just say, you know, look at the TV stations for that. It should be really interesting. Okay, shall we look at some animal mummies now? Here's our little fake kitty. Yeah, that's a type of ibis. Shelly, this is the one that you put out on that Twitter feed that was the fake snake bundle. Here's our little kitty with the... I'll get this out of the way. <laughs> I know. It's really a sweet, but you can actually see, like the linen's partially gone there, so you can see it. These are both ibis mummies. This is sort of how they're often found, um, in these kinds of ceramic jars just buried in the sand, and it would have had like a, some sort of plaster resin, and usually a bowl. There would be a ceramic bowl on top and then sealed with a plaster resin. 